The Gospel According to Toy Story. This is part two from the Toy Story 2. Last time I was with you, we uh, showed you the Gospel According to Toy Story 1. Now understand that Jesus back in his day told a lot of stories and he illustrated and taught the kingdom of God through these stories. So he said there was a farmer who was in a field and there was a woman who lost a coin and uh, there was a man who found a treasure in a field. So he told these stories to emphasize and illustrate the kingdom of God. We are taking modern stories that you and I are familiar with and teaching and sharing the principles of God's Word. So I want to welcome all of you. Welcome those of you watching online, on Facebook, on SolidRock.tv, all of our streaming, YouTube, all that. Thank you for joining us. But listen, this is great because we can learn as God speaks to us. You know, God, how many know God's always speaking to us? He really is. We just need to pay attention and listen, and God is always speaking to us. And so even in a fun movie like Toy Story, God can speak to us. So Toy Story 1, I told you last time we shared about that. It was made for like $35 million, gross $360 million. That was 1995. So Toy Story 2 comes out in 1999, was going to uh, go straight to video, but they decided to release it in theaters, ended up grossing over $500 million, uh, uh, nominated for all kinds of awards. And why was it so popular? Because any film that connects with people, it, it just resonates in us. It touches us. And these stories are a mirror of our lives. The toys are us. They're a mirror of us. We see our stories in the toys. Our struggles. Their struggles are our uh, struggles. Their condition is our condition. In Toy Story 2, one of the main themes here is that Woody is, he's torn. And so his arm gets ripped and, and it's torn and he has to, they have to repair it over and over. And that's an illustration of our lives. All of us in some area are wounded, torn, ripped apart, broken. Now the great fear as a toy that when you're broken, they're going to put you on the shelf. And then you're forgotten. Or worse, Put in the yard sale, or worse, thrown in the trash. That's the great fear of a toy. Let's watch this. Bye, Woody. Thrown in the trash. And so this is the fear of a toy. In fact, there's another character in the movie, Wheezy. And uh, he's a little penguin, and his squeaker stopped working. And he's been thrown in the 25-cent bag in the yard sale. So all these toys are having these thoughts of, am I still going to be wanted or loved? We all have that same question. Will I be wanted? Will I be loved? Will I be needed? Especially as we get older and go through the different stages of life. Because in many ways, all of us are broken in some way. And as life goes on, we may feel more and more broken as we move on in life. And we start asking the question, do I have value? Or will I be discarded? Will I be set aside? Will I be forgotten? Will I be shelved? As we get older, we deal with that. I'm 56 years old now, and you know, it gets tougher every year when you have a birthday. You're like, yeah, it's a birthday, right? I mean, I turned 55. I qualified for the senior menu at IHOP. Come on, somebody. I'm like, man. By the way, I take advantage of it. I do. I'll take the senior menu, please. Number one senior, you know, get the discount, I like it, you know. But, you know, we, we start asking that question. When, you, when you're a teenager, now you turn 20, it's like, wow, i got to grow up now. When you turn 30, when you turn 40, it's like, whoa. And it just keeps happening. In fact, you know, we have a, a, a midlife crisis, you know, because we're at the middle stage of life. My daughter, who's 26, she tells me, Dad, millennials in their 20s, they're having quarter life crises now. You know what I'm saying? It's like... I'm 25, what am I going to do with my life? Do I have any purpose, any meaning, you know? And so we all go through these questions of, do I have value and meaning? Am I still going to be wanted, needed, loved? If I lose my job, if I get laid off, do I still have value? And we question ourselves, will anyone hire me and want me? Or if you're going, you go through a divorce, uh, do I still have value? Will someone love me or ever want me again? Maybe even more so, you've been rejected, you've been maybe abused, you've been hurt. 
wounded, torn, broken. Will anyone love me now? Well, this is where the gospel comes in. That no matter what has been done to you, no matter how much hurt you have gone through, how much brokenness you have gone through, and we've all had brokenness in our lives, Oh, the good news is that God says, Jesus says, I'll never give up on you. I'll never stop loving you. I want you. I need you. I want to be your friend. And you can believe in a God who believes in you. Come on, give a clap offering to the Lord. <laughs> believe in a God who loves you and believes in you. This is what's beautiful about the gospel. This is why we fall in love with Jesus, because he first loved us, and we love him back. In fact, Jesus had a very special place in his heart for broken people. For people in general, but especially broken people. And as you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you discover that Jesus spent a lot of time with broken people. One particular account that I remember is Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee to go visit a man. And I remember the first time that I went to Israel... We went, we, 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 we got on a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee from this area where I'm talking about where this man lived uh, among the tombs back in the Bible. He lived in a, in a, a, a he, he was filled with demons. And so we went from there all the way across to Tiberias. The last time I was in Israel, we did, the, we did a boat ride, but we did it the opposite way. But it's a pretty long journey to cross that sea. Jesus crossed the, the I'm sorry, not the Red Sea, the, the Sea of Galilee. Jesus crossed that huge lake to go see a man that nobody wanted to be around, who lived among the tombs because no one allowed him to live in town. They were afraid of him. He was filled with demons. And he would break the chains that they tried to shackle him down with. This man screamed and howled at night. He was tormented. He was disturbed. Nobody wanted to be around this guy. But Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, took the time, to go and see this man. And Jesus reached out to this man and Jesus became his friend and Jesus set him free and he was healed and he was whole. <laughs> Jesus loved to help broken people. Mary Magdalene, the Bible says, was plagued by demons. But Jesus becomes her friend and he loves her and she's the woman. She's the first person that discovered that Jesus rose from the dead. Prostitutes who came to Jesus. Talk about a broken, torn, ripped apart person, desperate person. She comes to Jesus, begins to wash his feet. Her tears are falling to his feet. And she's washing the feet of Jesus with her hair, washing the feet of Jesus. He loved her. He became her friend. He healed her and gave her a new life. Lepers, they were, they were outcasts. You stayed away from lepers. In fact, it was required in that day if you were a leper and someone was going to walk by, you were to cry out as a leper, unclean, unclean, so people would stay away from you. But Jesus became the friend of lepers. In fact, one wanted to be healed by Jesus, and he said, Jesus, are you willing to heal me? He says, I'm willing. And he touched the man. He touched the leper, which was against the religious law of that day. But Jesus touched the leper, and he healed him. Jesus was a friend with Samaritans. Jesus, a Jew, Samaritans and Jews didn't get along, and Jesus had conversations and made friends with Samaritans and gave them life and blessing and hope. Jesus was known as a friend to tax collectors. Jesus was known as a friend to sinners, broken people. In Toy Story, there's a song that's in every one of the films, all four of them, a song by Randy Newman that says, you've got a friend in and that's what Jesus is saying to you and me. You've got a friend in me. Doesn't matter how wounded you are, how broken you are, how many times you've been rejected, Jesus says, you've got a friend in me and I care about you. I care a lot about you. In fact, if you've been wounded or broken or hurt, I even love you more. I, I want to be your friend even more. You know, people say, well, does God love some people more than others? And we would say, no, no. You know, actually, I think he does love some more than others at certain times. When we go through those broken moments, when we're down and out and we're hurting, maybe going through a loss of a loved one, we're lonely, we're grieving, whatever, I believe God just loves those people a little bit more because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He just says, I'm going to love those people a little bit more. I'm going to reach out a little bit more. 
God says to you in your brokenness and in your hurt and in your wounds, I see the beauty in you. I see the good in you. I'm not giving up on you. And I'll take your brokenness and I'll take your wounds and I will turn them around for something good and they will turn into a blessing for other people. Come on. He turns our ashes into beauty. Give Jesus a praise offering today. Jesus wants to be your friend. He calls us friends in the scripture. There's a song that we used to sing when I was a kid. Let me share a little bit of it. This is what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a prayer to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pain we bear oh Everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. it to the Lord in prayer. Now listen to this part. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? it to the Lord in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. Come on, Jesus is your friend. Give him a clap offering today. Hallelujah. What a friend we have in Jesus. So Jesus is saying, you know what? You've got a friend in me no matter how broken, wounded you have been, the rejection you've been through, the hurt, the abuse that you've endured, Jesus says, I still want to be your friend. And what is the mark of true friendship? In fact, when Jesus says, I call you friends, the f Greek word is philos, which we get the word phileo, love, affectionate love. God has an affectionate love for you. Now, what does that look like? It's not just feelings. When you're a friend, you want to you wanna help your friend. You want to do something for your friend. In fact, in the story, Toy Story, Wheezy, he's in the, he's the little penguin that I told you is being sold, and he's in the 25-cent box. And Woody says, no, 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 we can't let Wheezy go. We got to help him. And, he says, and so Woody takes off out of the house and down to the little box of the 25-cent box, and he takes him out of the box and gets him back in the house. But in that process, somehow along the way, a human comes along, and when you're a toy and a human comes along, you got to play dead. And so a child picks him up, Woody, and, and, and takes him to Andy's mom. She wants to buy it. Or to the mom and she wants to buy it, but no, he's not for sale. And so they kind of put him back on the table there. And this is when we're introduced to the bad guy in the film. His name is Al. Al has been looking for a Woody toy figure. And he doesn't want to play with him. He wants to collect him because he's a toy collector. And he knows he's got a, a collector in Japan who will pay a premium price for this toy Woody. And he thinks, oh, he's got a ripped arm, but I can fix that. And, and uh, so he really, really wants this toy uh, to sell it to this toy collector. Let's watch the clip. So evil Al steals Woody. Woody gets stolen. The rest of the film is about Woody's friends, Philos, Phileo, Woody's friends trying to rescue him. This is the definition of true friendship. That's what this movie's about. It's about friendship, and it's sacrificing yourself to save your friend. 
Isn't this what Jesus has done for you and me? Oh my goodness, that he saw us in our condition, but Jesus said, I will do whatever it takes, even if I have to take a crown of thorns on my head, nails in my hands and feet, whip, whipping lashes on my back, I will die on a cross, I will do whatever it takes to save my friends. Come on, this is, this is, the, this is the story of the gospel. And so we see in the rest of this movie that Buzz Lightyear and all of Woody's friends, they're trying to rescue him. In fact, they come to one point where to get him out of Al's toy barn where he sells these collector toys, they're going to have to cross a busy street. Talk about sacrificing for your friend, willing to do whatever it takes. So they come to this busy intersection to hopefully go and find wet Woody and rescue him. Let's watch. <laughs> so this is the mark of friendship. See, what does friendship really look like? It's sacrifice. It's sel uh, selflessness. It's giving of yourself to help someone else, especially when they're in need, and that's what we see here. It's the willingness to be inconvenienced to help a friend. And I appreciate that in the church we see this. When people are going through a difficult time, we're there to be a friend. That's, that's what I love about life groups. Life groups create a bond, a friendship, that when someone's going through a tough time, maybe they've lost a loved one, there's that life group to bring support, prayer, food, whatever it is. I love it. So this is what Christ has done for us. Jesus says, this is what it means to be a true friend. Here's how he shows it in John 15. Look at the scripture. John 15, verse 12. Jesus, these are the words of Jesus. He says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. Friends. This is what Jesus says. We need to be that. In fact, Jesus said you can sum up the whole life of faith to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And someone comes along and asks Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? So Jesus tells a story. He says, well, there was a, a, a man one time who was making a journey from Jericho to Jerusalem. That's about a 16-mile journey through some very rough terrain. And he's walking on his way to Jerusalem, and he's attacked on this lonely road by thieves and robbers. They rob him of everything. They strip him of everything. They beat him and leave him half dead. Jesus continues with the story and says, a Levite, so it's a religious person, he comes by and he sees the man lying there half dead, but he walks on the other side of the road and acts like he doesn't see him and he just keeps on going. Another religious man walks by and sees him but says, oh, I got to go out there waiting for me at the temple. And so he just passes by and keeps on going. Then comes a Samaritan. Remember, Samaritans and Jews don't get along. There was a prejudice there. And so the Jew is half dead and here comes a Samaritan, but the Samaritan feels for the man, so he stops. And he begins to tend to his wounds and he heals, bandages him up and helps the man and gets him on his animal and brings him to the next town and gets him in a place where they can care for him and he pays the bill and he says, and look, I'll be back in a few days to check on him and if there's more to the bill, I'll pay the bill. I want you to take care of this man. And Jesus says, who is the real neighbor? And they said, the Samaritan. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and be a friend. This is what it means to be a friend. So there are times when we are called as a church to do the same thing, to love as Jesus has loved us. He said, as I have loved you, I want you to love one another. Are there times we get tired? Yes. I've been in ministry now, I don't know, 33, 34 years. And sometimes it gets weary. Sometimes it gets tiring. But you know what? I say, you know what? We're going to keep on loving. We're going to keep giving. We're going to keep serving. And we have people in our church who are serving in different places. Thank God for our wonderful nursery caregivers, people serving in children's ministry, in our cafe, our media team, our resource, information, our ushers. I mean, I could go on and on and on. We have our Raven's Nest food ministry that we come and serve and help people who need some food. And we, we, we do all these things. We, we, we give to our community over and over. We, we, we'll be giving away free shirts with our I Can rally next month. And we'll be giving out new shoes to kids for the first day of school. Why do we do that? What are we doing when we say that, when we serve in the nursery, when we serve in ministry? What are we saying to our community? What are we saying to the coastal man? 
We're saying, hey, you matter to God, you matter to us, you've got a friend in us. You've got a friend at Solid Rock. You matter to God. We love you. We want to be your friend. So can I encourage you? In fact, let's give a big round of applause to our dream team. Come on. They do such a great job. They're serving us. They're serving us. They're being a friend. Can I encourage you to do the same? Get on a dream team and say, Pastor, I want to be a friend to people. I want to help. I want to serve. In fact, the scripture says it like this, Proverbs 18, 24. There's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A friend that's closer than even kin or family. Are you being a true friend? See, that's the story of Toy Story 1 and 2. It's about friendship. The other part of the story is, I think a Toy Story, it's all about identity. Because in the story, again, it's all about Woody trying to remember that he's Andy's toy. Of course, he's stolen by evil Al in this movie, and he's going to be put away as a, you know, a memento, a, a collector's item. And what Al does is he paints over the shoe, over the bottom of the boot. He takes away Andy's name. Because the mom would might write the name of Andy on all the toys to let the toys know, or let people know that, you know, they belong to Andy. But the toys felt like, oh, I belong to Andy. Look, his, na his name is on me. I'm his. I don't know if you do that to some of your belongings. I know when Ava was a cheerleader at Veterans, you know, she had all these outfits, and she had shoes, and she had socks, and she had equipment, and she had this and that and all kinds of stuff. So my wife was constantly putting Ava C, Ava C, Ava C on everything, you know. And it was trying to say to everybody, this uniform, this piece of clothing, this piece of equipment, this belongs to this particular person. Let me tell you something. In the gospel, when you get baptized, God is saying to you and to the world, you belong to me. Amen. You belong to me. When you bring your children and you dedicate your children to God like we do here at Solid Rock, you're telling your children, you belong to God. And God says to you and me, you are mine. You are mine. You belong to me. And so Andy's name is inscribed on the feet of the toys. And this is where the conclusion of the story comes is that Andy, I'm sorry, Woody, you know, he's thinking, okay, I'll no longer be Andy's toy. I'm just going to be a collector's item. And all of a sudden, he hears a song that reminds him of Andy, the boy. And he scrapes off the bottom of the boot, and he sees Andy on there. And he wakes up and realizes, wait a minute, I belong to Andy. Let's watch this last clip. So he sees his name. He sees Andy's name on the bottom of his boot. He says, I belong to Andy. Let me show you something. God has inscribed his name on you. Let me read from Revelation 3, verse 12. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. I'm here to tell you, you belong to God, and your name is written on the heart of God. Your name is written in heaven. Hallelujah. Oh, I want you to know, you belong to God. Have you forgotten that you belong to God? Have you forgotten that, you know what, you are His? Have you forgotten that He formed you, He created you, and He made you for Himself? That he formed you and he shaped you in your mother's womb. That scripture says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God says you are precious in my sight. You are the apple of my eye. You have been marked by God. You have been baptized by God. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. You've been chosen by God. Oh, the enemy wants you to forget who you are and whose you are. And when we forget who we are... And when we forget whose we are, we wander, we drift, we get involved in things that we shouldn't. We start thinking wrong because we forget who we are. But I'm here to tell you the moment that you received Christ and you were born again, you became a son and a daughter of God for good. When you were baptized in water, you were told, you know what, you now belong to God. You're a child of God. Here's what Jesus said in Luke 10 verse 20. He said, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. 
Oh, don't ever forget. Don't ever forget who you are, no matter how many times you've been rejected, torn, ripped, wounded or broken, Jesus says, I'm here to love the broken. I'm here to love the brokenhearted. You're my child. I love you. I believe in you. Every day you're going to pray that, God, thank you that I am yours. Never let me forget that I am yours. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your love because I know who I am. I belong to Jesus. Give the Lord a clap offering. Come on. Give the Lord a clap offering. Hallelujah. Would you stand all over the room?